direct it to the panel, uh, address, address it to the, uh, the Gmail on my left, left hand side on the screen. And as a courtesy to our panel members, we also ask that you silence all communication devices at this time. I would like to welcome you to the industry panel titled Emerging Concepts, Capabilities, and Technologies in the Indo-Pacific. All bios are available on the AFCIA app under today's panel event. Now I would like to turn it over to our moderator, Brigadier General Paul Fredenberg, United States Army, retired, Executive Vice President, AFCIA International. Well, aloha. Uh, that's pretty good for uh, four o'clock in the afternoon, I gotta tell you. Uh, and I'm happy with the, with the folks that have, have come out here. I, I tell you, I'm looking forward uh, to moderating this panel. Uh, and I want to thank everyone here for their participation. There are some exciting things uh, happening out here uh, in the Indo-PACOM theater. Uh, and I think there's some innovation and some, uh, we've talked about, um, you know, thinking differently a little bit here. And so I think there's some of that you're going to see out here of, of how the team uh, and I say the whole team is, is uh, addressing this. And so I'm, ex I'm excited here today. We're going to talk ab about how Indo-PACOM and their partners are identifying technologies, tactics, techniques, procedures to address their warfighting requirements through innovation, experimentation, and exercises. Uh, and so I know that there's a lot of people uh, here at this conference uh, that play, again, as the larger team with a capital T uh, are going to play a part in this. I'm going to take uh, an opportunity to introduce each of our panel members and give them each a, a few minutes for some opening comments. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Rear Admiral Susan Breyer Joyner. She's the Deputy J6, uh, Deputy Director J6, and the Deputy J6 for JAD C2. Uh, on the Joint Staff. Now she's got numerous uh, operational tours, fleet assignments, shore assignments, and joint tours, but she has uh, experience out here in the Indo-Pacific to include operational and joint assignments. Uh, and as a flag officer, she's uh, recently served as the Navy Enterprise Networks and Cybersecurity Division Director at the Office of the Chief of Naval Operations prior to her current assignment. So uh, Rear Admiral Susan Breyer Joyner, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so it's interesting. I've been in the seat about five months. And when I reported, General Kroll, who was the J6 at the time, said, your primary focus is going to be JADC2. What does that mean? Um, and so I spent the first few months really trying to understand what we're trying to accomplish for JADC2. And what I would tell you is, I think we need to improve our messaging. I think we're doing a lot better than we get credit for in the open press, and I think our conversations with Congress um, support that. Do I think we're moving fast enough? Absolutely not. We have an adversary in this theater who gets a vote, and I think we need to move faster. How do we do that? Well, I will tell you that I don't think a hardware focused solution is probably going to get us where we need to go, although there are changes that we need to make there. I think we need to focus on how we free the data, how we free it from networks, how we free it from systems, how we make it highly interoperable, highly interoperable at tactically relevant speeds. So when I talk about joint all domain command and control, I want to remind people that it's a verb command and control. At the end of the day, that's what we have to be able to do as a warfighting force. And how are we going to speed the commander's decision cycle? We do it by breaking down the barriers of data transiting from point to point. We have command and control at the tactical level. We hear a lot about fires control. That is absolutely a key part. But we've got five other warfighting functions that we have to be able to command and control in. And it's important to remember that as well. Because at the end of the day, if we focus all of our efforts on one warfighting function, we're going to suboptimize the others that are going to be just as critical to this fight. And so, 
Joint all domain command and control. It's a verb. Free the data. How do we break down the barriers between our systems and networks? That's what I think we need to focus on, what we need to accelerate, and what we're going to need to deliver decision advantage to our warfighting commanders across all of the functions and at all of the levels of war. Thank you. Good start. Lots to think about. And I'm not going in any particular order, so I'm just going to keep everybody on edge uh, <laughs> to, to see who's next. Uh, but uh, so, uh, our, our, and our next uh, panelist, uh, Brigadier General Michael R. Drowley, or Johnny Bravo, as he uh, prefers to be referred to, uh, is the, uh, the director of the Joint Training and Exercise, J7, at the U.S. Indo-PACOM Command. Uh, as director, he develops and executes the joint exercise and joint training programs for headquarters U.S. Indo-PACOM and subordinate forces within the Indo-Pacific Indo area of responsibility. Additionally, he develops and implements concepts into the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, such as the Pacific Multi-Domain Training and Experimentation Capability, or PIMTEC. And I think uh, if you don't know what that is, we're going to find out what that is. So. Uh, Johnny Bravo, floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate uh, being here and uh, with the team to be able to go over some of our initiatives and, and our priorities. Uh, when you look at the J7, it's kind of come full circle in its evolution and, and development. So previously, uh, the seven had been primarily focused on humanitarian uh, assistance, disaster response exercises. Uh, it was then moved to the J3 uh, and was picking up more of a how do we do continuous operations. Uh, but based off of Admiral Aquilino's guidance, uh, we re-stood up uh, a few months ago, so that way we could be laser focused on a few of his priorities. Uh, the number two is that PIMTECH initiative uh, that we just discussed. And really what PIMTECH is for is to enable a lot of the rest of the efforts that go on within Indo-PACOM. Uh, so when you look at my portfolio in the J7, uh, one of the first tranches of that portfolio is exercising. How can I make the most realistic scrimmage I possibly can to ensure our force is ready? Uh, so when you think about it, if we have to go from deter and competition into defeat, if there's an airman, a rifleman, a sailor out there that looks themselves in the mirror and goes, I'm not ready for this, then, then I have failed. So how do we be able to do that? That is what PIMTECH allows us to do. So when you look at our training enterprise, we have some phenomenal capability, whether that's the Nevada Test and Training Range, whether that's the National Training Center, but how can we take those capabilities and move them forward so that way we can provide integrated deterrence while at the same time making sure that we're ready and then pick key investments to that way we can experiment and rapidly develop to get them into the warfighter's hands. Uh, and so that, that really is our marching orders of the seven, is how can we do that in a rapid fashion? And it really is a team sport. We rely on the six to make sure that we have the communication architecture to be able to do that, the guidance from JADC2 to incorporate that in to ensure that we are working on how we're able to target uh, in the fog and friction of those environments, uh, the eight uh, to lead us in that experimentation trail, and then the five and the three, we inform operations and plans. So we're really somewhat in the center of that nexus to make sure that we're taking the guidance that we receive and are able to provide achievable results. Uh, and that's primarily done through our PEMTECH program and our exercise program to get that accomplished. Thank you. All right, so I'm, I'm keeping everybody on edge because I'm, 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 that was an information operation because I am actually going in some sense of an order here, Mark, so you're, you're next. But uh, <laughs> Brigadier General Mark Miles, uh, U.S. Army Director, Command Control, Communications and Cyber Directorate, J6, U.S. Indo-PACOM. Uh, career Signal Officer, and has led and commanded every echelon up to the Signal Command level. He's deployed several times, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and numerous times in Afghanistan, but he has a tremendous experience here uh, in Indo-Pacific Theater. He was a battalion commander here. Uh, user pack uh, deputy G6 and he commanded the 516th signal brigade here so he's steeped uh, in knowledge of uh, operations uh, and networks here in the Pacific so Mark go over to you well, thanks sir with that, with that intro you think I'd have a better tan <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, 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 first of all I, I know that I've uh, I, I was on, on a panel yesterday so I'm not going to I'm not going to repeat any of the intro or, or, or any of the kind of the baseline 
J6 perspective, but I would like to start out by emphasizing and kind of uh, piggybacking on one of General Rowley's comments there about it, with, with the how, how important and critical the PIMTEC is, but also not news to a lot of people in this room how hard that is from an IT side, the, the J6 piece of that. You know, we uh, simulating an exercise with a peer adversary, that's a tough job that he's a full-time job of that. Integrating that into a network that's potentially a partner network that is even potentially stood up just to support an exercise, uh, that comes with its own range of challenges. And I know there are a lot of... Uh, a lot of industries in the room, a lot of people to, that look at those, those bandwidth problems, those integration problems, um, and there's a lot of area where, where we could use help in solving that problem. Uh, I, I really like the name of this panel, Emerging Concepts, Capabilities, and Technologies in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, for one, one particular reason is that it's more than just, I, I like that we've included the, the concepts and the capabilities not just the buying technologies because it's cool and it, and it meets a certain, you know, one need or one requirement that's important to a certain service or, uh, or function that we do. We, we, again, Mark Miles' opinion a little bit here, we, we shoot ourselves in the foot occasionally in the IT world by, by doing, pretending that we're acquisition professionals where we're not, by... Uh, by doing, uh, by purchasing or fielding material solutions where we haven't fully thought through the concepts. We haven't fully developed con ops. We haven't fully thought through the training plan. We haven't fully thought through how it integrates into existing capabilities, how it maybe supersedes some of existing technologies, you know, how maybe it impacts longer term O&M and builds into the greater strategy. So when... I like that, that we've included more than just how we develop or acquire technologies. And, and that's another area that I really encourage that, that interface to happen. And I think we'll talk in this panel how that interface happens and how we can better enable that um, as we partner uh, with a lot of the, the great concepts and a lot of the great industry ideas in the, in the room. But when we do that partnering, I, I encourage the, that to include some of that, that look on the, okay, what does this do to, here's a con op, here's a draft con op that, that I've come up there, here's how I envision it being used, or, you know, the team that I have is an appreciation for the environment it's being entered into, here's, here's a recommendation, or here's, here's part of how it would be integrated, here's a training plan, here's a developmental, here's the skill sets that you would need long term um, as you manage or, or incorporate this technology into the greater uh, TTPs of how you do business. So uh, hopefully we, we get into that discussion as, as through, but, but as, as opening comments, I kind of wanted to, to emphasize that point because really in previous panel discussion that I was on, we, we hadn't really dove into that, that portion of the, of the interface of the fielding before. So looking forward to the conversation and, and a lot of the great questions. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you, Mark. That's good. That's very, very good. All right, our next panelist is Colonel Ronnie Geronimo. He's the Director of Communications J6 at uh, Special Operations Command Pacific. And he's been uh, command and key staff positions at the tactical and operational level in some very, very challenging assignments. I can attest I've been tracking your career for quite some time. Uh, notably, uh, experience in Indo-Pacific theater as well, serving in the 25th ID, USERPAC, 516th Signal Brigade in Hawaii, and the first Signal Brigade in the Republic of Korea. So, uh, <laughs> Ronnie, over to you. Hey, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. So, I've been in the job for about four months, and I want to share with you all <clears throat> the two things that my boss, Admiral Williams, has tasked me to do and carry out, and which is really what's driving all of our emerging concepts, capabilities, and technology pursuits. And that the first one being, hey, Ronnie, find out what Ukraine is doing to communicate externally to the partner forces that they're communicating with now. That's number one. The second thing was, bring that to the Pacific, <laughs> right? And figure out how to get that capability to the partner force of choice, and make sure that it's re resilient, reliable, and survivable. So everything that we've done for the past four months now to develop new capabilities has, has been around that. So we've taken a lot of lessons learned from our SOC year counterparts, our USASOC counterparts to get 
those key things that they've taken out of the Ukraine conflict, and we start applying those lessons learned here, and, and what we'd love to show you, or at least share with you, are some of the key technologies that's driving towards those efforts. So looking forward to this discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So just from uh, just a format here, I'm going to start off. I have a few uh, primer questions uh, just to get the conversation started. But please, um, uh, I know there's going to be a lot of questions here. But please uh, text or uh, excuse me, email your questions, uh, and the email uh, address is on the board there. So uh, I'm going to start off. But so uh, Johnny Bravo, this is going to come at you because PimpTech seems to be kind of a a focal point uh, to kind of bring all this uh, together. And so you talked a little bit about what it is. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about the why, but also what are the emerging concepts that you're kind of focused on right now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so there's really two components uh, to PimTech. Uh, the first one is how do we create that training environment that provides the venue for high-end training a conduit for live virtual constructive. Again, so we can do that in a forward manner. Uh, we wanna be able to do it in the environment that we think we may have to actually execute in. So we can be familiar with the airspace, the weather patterns, the terrain. Uh, and that is also a capability that will allow us to have opportunities to present integrated deterrence uh, to any potential challengers that may be out there. So building that training environment, providing advanced training capabilities is, is really one aspect of it. The other one is within that environment, how can we pick concepts that allow us to rapidly iterate and bring capability to, to the warfighter? Uh, and that could be as simple as command and control uh, to all encompassing as our joint fires network. And so we wanna build that domain that allows us to get rapid repetitions to get some of the best practices out there, to pick key investments that will allow us to close from discovery to test to implementation in as tight a chain as possible. And so PimTech really goes between those two venues, the training venue that gives you the, the, the space to be able to do that, and then the identification of programs that helps us with those initiatives. And that's why really when you look at the priorities that we have in Indopaycom, it's one of the top priorities because this is going to advance our capabilities, not only from a readiness aspect, a deterrence aspect, but really trying to find those key technologies that will allow us to command and control, be able to target, sense, make sense, connect across the board, and do those things for, for our team. And so the PimTech, as we program that out, we bake it into our exercises so that way we have key dates when we're trying to get to IOC, and then into FOC in a very, very short amount of time. But it's also agile enough and adaptable enough where we can take key programs quickly inject it in, put it into the ringer of our exercises or our operations and provide quick feedback in. So it's really trying to improve the speed of our iterative process to bring capability on board. Now, we, we've heard from the leadership here uh, from Indopaycom and from every component this week about how important it is to think differently to move forward with a sense of urgency to speed up and, and a lot of discussion around speeding up decision processes and, and sorting through uh, information uh, and seeing, understanding, and acting prior to the adversary. Uh, the other thing we've heard, the other major theme I've heard from all of our senior leaders is interoperability with our allies and partners, um, strengthening that um, and, uh, and leveraging those allies and partners, uh, again, uh, with a big T and team. Uh, and how these are all integral components of another major theme was this integrated uh, deterrence. And so i just like to, um, I, I, I'll go down, Let me. I'm gonna start with you, uh, Ronnie, but um, what are some of your priorities, your current you know, focus areas uh, for integrating concepts and capabilities and technologies, you know, kind of, kind of in line with what our senior leaders are telling us. What, what, are, your, what are your kind of focus points um, for concepts, capabilities, and technology that, that need to be integrated? All right, sir, thank you for the question. Sir, um, just going back to the Ukrainian lessons learned, so what we've learned is that uh, the Ukrainian conflict has demonstrated how crucial it is to have non-standard platforms uh, towards information exchange. Right, in, in today's operational environment. So not only must we stay the course and develop an mission partner environment and secret releasable capabilities, you know, to ensure that we, we can have our tactical mission command systems interoperate 
across the force, but we also must recognize that enriched data from, observed from commercially or, or publicly available information shared by U.S. and partner forces of choice uh, is just as effective um, in, in, in getting our point across and assisting that uh, partner force in a time of crisis. So a lot of our technology focus is towards delivering that, that capability to push that information to them real time. So in, in situations where authorities limit our abilities towards information sharing, another lesson from Ukraine is that um, relationships matter. Your partners and allies matter. Right? So one thing that we took away is that, you know, identifying those partners and allies that don't share, don't have those restrictions and working around some of the restrictions that we have by pushing data to them and eventually getting it to the partner force of choice can just, can be just as important as the, the latest CDS solution that's out there. So it's not really a technology, but more of a process. And that's what we've seen um, really become very, very useful in the current conflict that we're really watching so closely because we see the same things that we're gonna to have to work through. Just don't think we're ever gonna get into the same, same platform anytime soon, right? I think there's a good push towards a unified standard out there. But if you factor in our partner forces who have capabilities, and more importantly, the ones that don't have capabilities, it becomes very challenging to do that in, in, in a in a standard uh, format or platform. So identifying what's already already available, which is the data, right, I think is, is our primary focus. And how to move that and having multiple different platforms to do that is key to what we want to pursue in the special operations community. Thanks. Mark, same, same uh, question uh, to you. For, again, looking out o over all of the you know, including components and the, the whole joint picture here. What, what, are you, what are the kind of priorities that you're focused on? All right, sure. Yeah, there's, so we've got five. We've got five um, lines of effort or really priorities in the J6, and four of them we definitely are, are leveraging emerging technologies, concepts, capabilities, and partnerships to, to get after. And I'll go really brief, uh, rapidly through them. But uh, first is our mission partner environment, uh, which, if you're, you know, uh, it, different definitions of what mission partner environment is out there, but definitely uh, in, in Indo-PACOM, it is our, it's the combination of all our mission partner networks, our, our one-to-one -one across a cross-domain solution with our key allies and partners that we would, we would fight and win a conflict with. And that is, uh, that includes securing those mission partner networks and in securing that mission partner environment. It's, and, and so when, when I use that as a top priority, that's the ones and zeros. That's the hardware and software. Uh, that, that gets it done. And we're partnering largely with CENTCOM. So anybody that's, that's already working closely with CENTCOM, uh, we're, you know, we're partnering with their, the, their CPE effort. But that's also looking at the data security and the zero trust uh, piece of that, which I know we have uh, just from, from interface over the last two days, I know we've got a lot of um, um, great concepts and capabilities in the zero trust arena. Number two is assured C2. That's our second priority. The, uh, in, in that you know, largely as, as a career communicator is, is PACE plans. As we, when we, when we uh, develop any exercise or effort or initiative, you look at how we're going to communicate. If that's not going to work, you look at the, the multiple paths. Uh, that's still important, obviously, but I'd say in a data-centric world, that's additionally your PACE plan needs to build in what data is most important. So if I've got full access to, my, to the low latency fiber or line of sight communications, great, I can... I can you know, support all the warfighting functions equally, but there needs to be a plan, and we haven't really been, you know, we don't have a lot of experience in DOD of working in environments where we have an adversary that would cut off our uh, our pipes or, or, or force us to make that prioritization of bandwidth, but it's on, it on us to, to not only do that pri uh, prioritization, but to have systems and technologies and processes and concepts, to stay with the name of this, that, 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 uh, that are enabled ahead of time to make a data pace plan effective uh, where, wherever you are in echelon of conflict. Uh, and also, along with that assured C2 priority, where our data is being stored and where our data is being processed is, is, is in some ways a unique problem to this theater. Um, given the maritime conflict, given the tyranny of distance, uh, given the capability of a peer adversary to impact maybe some some uh, reach back links that may or may not be limited in number, uh, 
you know, where, you know, we, a lot of organizations, a lot of echelons are going for, are trying to leverage cloud solutions. I like to say in this theater, it's about hybrid cloud uh, because there has to be, we, we've got to be very conscious about where our data is being stored and where it's being processed. And we have options now that frankly, uh, we could leverage more uh, as we're going forward. Uh, number three is, is our, is our uh, upgrades, is, is upgrading the technology and the systems in our headquarters. Uh, we, you know, we were, we're a little, we're showing a little long in the tooth of, uh, of our headquarters building and, and plus, I mean, we're the most technologically advanced force on the planet, so we should be fighting the most modern technology and, uh, and you know, my, my boss is going to fight from Camp Smith. I, you know, that is, our, our headquarters is our war fighting platform. So a couple efforts in, or, and, and that'll probably be a constant modernization effort, uh, but you know, that, that deserved its own priority, deserved its own poem, and, and it uh, absolutely uh, is, is bolstered by some of the relationships, really some of the relationships we have in the room already. Our fourth priority is partnerships. That one's not as, uh, not as heavy of a technical problem. Um, uh, but that is, that is a very complex problem with 32 different relationships with 32 different partners. Uh, but number five is our, our workforce development. So if we're gonna, if we're gonna stay near the, the edge of state-of-the-art technology, and we need to, uh, we owe it to the nation to stay near the edge of it, the, then I've gotta have a workforce that understands and can speak those technologies. And that, that training piece goes into a little bit of what I, what I talked about in my opening comments, but you know, sometimes we for, forget about that um, or we, we overlook it in, in, a, in a rush to, to stay on, on the technology curve, but uh, training that workforce, training the planners, at least to the level of being uh, a, a, of an understanding level. So not, not necessarily all the way to professional certification or at the same level of the engineers uh, that, that you employ, but they've got to be, we've, they, they, you've got to speak the language in order to to, to uh, fight in that area, and we need to be able to fight in that area. So, sir, those would be about the five areas of, and priorities we have. Thank you. And uh, so, Johnny Bravo, are there any other concepts, you know, in development uh, priorities, uh, you know, kind of uh, adding on to that for in the U.S. Indo Bacon? I would say, again, if you stick with the two themes of trying to advance that training environment, um, if you looked at the previous years, the, really the effort was how do we shore up the foundation of existing capabilities that we have? So that's like the ranges that we have in Alaska, the West Coast ranges, uh, what we have here in Hawaii and Guam, because the goal now is to move west of the international date line. We need to move those capabilities forward. Uh, and it's how do we replicate those challenges that we may be up against, which again requires networks and communication to be able to, to transmit all that, collect all that data, uh, and ensure that we're building that, that good training environment. Uh, embedded in that and the capability side, it really comes down to how can we continue to improve and uh, rapidly iterate on our joint fires network. And so that is creating a kill web where we have a target, it is sensed by multiple different entities, communicated to multiple different entities, and then can be serviced by multiple different entities. And so that way we have resiliency, we have options, uh, and, and therefore we have leverage and overmatch. And so I would say as we're trying to think and act differently, operate differently within those two venues, that's what it is. We're not just trying to exercise for exercise sake. I mean, it's with purpose now, uh, because that's the environment that we're in. And to be able to do that, it really, uh, I would say that the mainstay of that think and operate differently is the Joint Fires Network that we're doing rapid uh, iterations on. And how do we command and control that, distribute that information is part and parcel to, to all of that. Thank you. And so all this work is going on uh, within indo Paycom, but uh, Susan, maybe you can help. How, is this informing? Is this uh, helpful? Or, are we learning back in, you know what I mean, the department on the joint staff? Is this feeding back into the larger, you know, JADC2? Those two main priorities here, this, this mission partner environment or the ability to collaborate and coordinate and this improving the, the uh, you know, decision processes are core, you know what I mean, to JADC2. Uh, is how, how's, how, are, how are you receiving, how are these efforts out here informing the larger, you know, DOD efforts? Well, what I would say is we have very strong partnerships with Indo-PACOM, and I'm actually out here today to expand it. So the sixes have been talking. This is not just a six problem, right? When we talk about mission threads and we talk about operations, 
it starts to push into the three and the seven and the two, right? And so when we talk about data sharing, it's not just within US forces, it's not just with our partners, it's also with the IC. And so figuring out how we break down those data barriers between those entities I think is going to be key. We've been getting the six feedback, we brought the eight into the discussion when we started to talk about the priorities for experimentation and now we're further expanding our partnership with the other J codes. What I would offer, especially in this theater, is the, um, the environment that we practice in is very important. I would like to say the words live, virtual, and constructive because there are many things that we should not be doing live. We should be doing it in an environment that the adversary has difficulty seeing how we're practicing to fight. I think that's very important. When we talk about training and we talk about proficiency, what I would say is folks our age, maybe the 06s and up, we need to increase our proficiency in digital, right? I'm just, it, we talk about digital natives, they inherently know how to operate the things, but they don't necessarily know the back-end engineering and things like that. But unless senior leaders understand the questions to ask and understand the answers they receive when we talk about the digital environment, I think we will still um, fall a little short. And then the final piece that I'd like to offer is when we talk about zero trust, the way we're implementing it today is at the enterprise level pretty specifically. And I think we all intuitively understand that zero trust probably is not going to look the same in the tactical environment, nor should we try and force that enterprise solution to work in the tactical environment. And so what we started earlier this year is I call it security interoperability in the tactical environment. What will zero trust look like for fire control systems, for the tactical networks, for the non-traditional IT? We had our first meeting in September, our next meeting's coming up in December, and we're bringing the 5i partners, we've invited them. So we can start to talk about not just what it looks like for the US forces, but what it looks like as we're trying to share data at tactically relevant speeds in the operational environment, not bringing it back, although that's going to be important, but we define those war fighting requirements and then we turn to DISA and say, we need you to please support this at the enterprise level because identity is going to be key and we really only need one identity it's got to be able to extend down to the tactical environment. And how are we going to do it for our partners? That's really important. And so, again, a partnership with the combat commanders, with the services, with DISA, with NSA, with the IC, and now bringing in our partners to figure out how we're going to share information in a secure way in the tactical environment. Thank you for that. And so we have a lot of uh, industry partners here with us today. We talked a little bit about some of the concepts and touched a little bit on the, on the technology, but are there some uh, specific examples of technology and, and probably more important and, and maybe on the minds of a lot of people here, how can our industry partners help here? Or how, th how can they get engaged in, in this process or how can they enter into the into the loop of uh, experimentation and, and things like that. I'll, I'll uh, uh, Janet Bravo, I'll let yeah. you take the first. Uh, hack yeah, uh, for a, from a process standpoint uh, for Indo-PACOM, uh, the J-8 is really our, our entry point uh, for the combat command, uh, and for good reason. Uh, if you were to go to General Miles and, with a program and then to myself and then to another J director, we may all be working on similar initiatives with, with different, different vendors, and so the J-8 is really the entry point 
And that's why we keep such close communication with the J-8 so they know what our requirements are, what the initiatives are that we're working on. Uh, so that way we can make sure that we're not either um, fratriciding each other out with different programs or uh, double tab and targets uh, based off of the number of programs that we have. Once that goes through the J-8, it really comes into the PEMTEC process now where we can take those investments and, and put them through the experimentation. And so if there is something out there, so like uh, we mentioned live virtual constructive earlier, that, that, that is a challenge uh, to provide to the force. We've got some great centers that are out there. Uh, the Elastic, uh, Alaska Virtual Training Center, uh, Jay Park has, has some phenomenal capability. There's the Virtual Test and Training Center uh, at Nellis Air Force Base. The Australians have a great capability. Um, but, and we need to bring that in so that way we can make determinations of what do we reveal and what do we need to conceal uh, as we uh, execute that high-end training. But what we found is the fidelity that you have as you go from the operation to the tactical level is exquisite to ensure that we are building the proper habit patterns. And that, and that is a tough problem set. So those were things that we're, we're asking industry like, hey, how do we make this better so that we were providing good solid training or uh, coming up with concepts that we know are executable. The Joint Fires Network is, is another one. So, you know, in one aspect, we build a nice, close, secure environment so that way we can run different, different concepts through uh, and take it. And then now we can incorporate that into our exercises and go, how do we make sure this is, this is ready? And so I think that's where we could use industry's help is, is get that entry point to the eight. And it was, we're communicating up like, hey, we're doing good work with this, but this is the next area that we need to explore that, that's where we identify where that help can come in from industry. Thanks. Mark, anything to add? Or? Uh, so it, within the six, we, we do have a um, uh, innovation and experimentation director. That's the good news. The bad news is it's three people. <laughs> the, uh, and, it, and it was stood up to support the J-8, uh, like I said. So it's, it's our plug into the experimentation and innovation. But I, I do, um, if you were at the keynote yesterday, General Rudd, took that as, as a do out to better enable that interface, both from a um, how technologies can support, so from a, a demand signal part of, of what technology, but also how we can, we as a headquarters, because I talked to him about it today, because I, I figured I was going to get some taskings related to that, um, but the, uh, how, how we can better inform of the, the unique challenges of this theater. So whether it be some of the cultural challenges we're dealing with or whether it be some of the, um, I, I'll say, recent opportunities that we have based on some policy changes or some, because a lot of times we run into, the, the, a lot of the roadblocks we have definitely aren't technological, especially when we're enabling or working closely with partners and allies. Uh, and sometimes opportunities will, will emerge that, that weren't there before. So, so taken as a do out and, and uh, uh, but as the, the seven said, we're, it's, it's going to come out somehow from, from our eight, but we absolutely owe that as, as a do out from this uh, as a headquarters. Any, any uh, different perspective or add from Sockback? Yes, sir. I want to echo uh, General Drowley's uh, comment about uh, using the J8s to actually host the industry open vendor demos to ensure that uh, we're given the industry partners the right requirements of what we're asking for. Um, at least from, from my experience, we do host those, but we don't normally vet them properly in, in, in many cases where, you know, vendors are coming in, providing uh, their capabilities without fully understanding the true requirements of what we're asking for. So a lot of times it's per the perception could be it's not the right tech or maybe bad tech. Right? So a lot of it is just ensuring that we follow a process and enforce that process in getting the requirements out there. So you have the industry partners have enough time to go ahead and understand what it is that's being, being requested and then show up to the table and actually demonst demonstrate that capability on the spot. So we are doing that. We're following that process at SOCPAC and we're, we're pushing that hard. But just, just like uh, earlier mentioned, it, the process isn't solid. So we are going to do that pretty soon with our innovations lab here at uh, Fort Island. So that'll be the first test. Thanks. And uh, one last question uh, before we're we have some audience questions that are that are waiting on. I want I want to get to those as soon as possible. But I did want to ask um, uh, Susan. There there was a and I don't know if it 
it, if it falls into this same, how do we get you know industry in, involved, or is this a, a, another method? But recently, uh, the DoD established an acquisition, integration, and interoperability office in the Pentagon, specifically um, synchronizing JADC two efforts across the department. But can you? Um, I, this is new news, uh, but uh, maybe you could give us your thoughts, or you know, what, what does this mean, or, or you know, how, how does this? How does that interface with you know I mean, your your position? But uh, may, maybe help us all understand uh, where the department's going and, and how it fits in. Excellent question. It's probably the elephant in the room. Everybody sees all of these new offices standing up, and they go, "Well, what does the JADC2 CFT think about that?" I think it's wonderful. Why? How much work do we have to do to get after JADC2? It is not a single organization's job. Everybody in DOD has a part in making JADC2 capabilities, warfighting capabilities, a reality. So when OSD ANS stands up an office focused on improving integration and interoperability within the programs of record, that's a win. When we stand up the Chief Digital and AI Office to make sure that we have data interoperability, that's a win. So each one of these is, I think, very promising in maturing how we're going to handle joint all domain command and control capabilities. The challenge, just as it is, has always existed in DOD, is making sure that we stay synchronized, making sure that we understand the warfighting priorities for the combatant commanders and the services. And so that's what we're working on. How do we normalize how we govern JADC2? And that's, that's ongoing work. It's not going to happen overnight, but we do have to figure out how we sustain these efforts in delivering these warfighting capabilities so it's not a one-off. Right? We can't accelerate to failure. We have to figure out how we're going to embed these new <coughs> demand signals for increased speed, increased agility, increased interoperability. How are we going to normalize it and standardize it across DOD? So I think it's a good news story. Thank you. Thank you. Now, if we could... Uh uh, take some questions from the audience. I know uh, there's there's several in the queue. Stand by one one moment. Sorry. I got the, the oh. first question, okay. sir. Uh, we have for uh, Colonel Geronimo. Rear Admiral Breyer Joyner used the phrase "deliver information at tactically relevant speeds." Can you characterize what speed of mission means to SOC PAC? And what does real-time data look like for mission command? That's a really good question. <laughs> I think my team set me up back there. So. <laughs> for, for our specific purposes, um, it, we're really in a different phase of competition that we're really focused on. So there's a lot of, lot of capabilities being developed for information exchange that's very focused on a lot of kinetic activities and, and what SOC PAC's focused on is how to, how to share the information that we are aggregating and analyzing and making sense of, right, in, in, in this phase of the competition continuum, right? So um, without getting into any, anything sensitive, there's, there's a lot of activities that's occurring now in the Pacific that we, we need to set, we need to sense and assess Right? A lot of that is open source, a lot of that's financial data, a lot of that could be uh, observed through public and commercial inf um, information. So to us, making sense of that information and advising our partner force, either in the first island chain, the periphery, and letting them know what activities are occurring that they need to be cognizant about is relevant information. How we deliver that information can come in many forms. We do have a lot of access and placements across the theater. Our folks are there persistently, right? But the type of information that we've received that's relevant and how, how much of that we can share with them, uh, the platforms aren't always there. So we have to rely on those things. Now, if we can create uh, a platform that we, that's interoperable with them, right, on the 
on unclassified level, right, commercially, commercial information level, it would make it a lot easier. And we are doing that in some cases. We just don't have enough kits. So I guess I could put it this way, right? We can anticipate a scenario where we're going to be required to provide direction, advice, and assistance to our partner force of choice without being present. So, so what we're doing now is we're taking every opportunity to look at the latest technology to enhance our remote advice and assist kits that, that's already out there uh, that, that can do that in, in the event that uh, we can't be present to the partner force of choice during a time of crisis or conflict. So having capabilities that can do that and making it more available to other partner forces is really what we're focused on. And it's a lot of it's just PAI, commercial data, that we could openly share now that we don't have to worry about classifying or declassifying. That was a long way to answer that very good question, so hopefully I, answer, I answered that. Thank you, sir. The next question, what is Indopaycom's ICAM strategy and known steps and known gaps? Margo, somebody else? <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question, and I'll say that we don't have an ICAM strategy. So we're, because um, that that implies that we're going to go a different direction than than uh, what DoD is going and what uh, uh, what this is implementing. So I know that's a that's a loaded question because ICAM's a very broad uh, mission set there, and there could be elements of it that you could work into an existing enterprise capability if it was synchronized. Uh, but, you know, using the word strategy implies a, a direction that may not be in alignment with the joint staff, so I definitely wouldn't bring that up with the deputy <laughs> six and the joint staff sitting two seats away from me. But, so sorry for that probably un, unhelpful answer. So would, you, would you want to add from that from the DOD yeah, yeah. perspective? I was just question. going to say that means that your strategy is the DOD strategy. All right. There, <laughs> there you go. go. All right. Um, I will say that, you know, DISA has the lead for developing the DOD ICAM strategy, and they're actually going through essentially what's experimentation, right? They are no longer saying we're going to fully buy into this solution. They are actually doing an iterative procure, assess, determine how we're going to move forward. And I think that's positive, and I think that's the way many of our IT-based acquisitions need to go in the future. Because every time we just buy into a single solution, we usually end up, and, and this is Susan Breyer Joyner speaking, having worked in IT for over 30 years, we end up backed into a corner that it's expensive to maintain and sustain and it's expensive to exit. DOD no longer has that luxury. We don't have the time, we don't have the resourcing. We have got to figure out a way to balance industry's need for making a profit, because that's very important, with DOD's need to be able to share its data broadly without proprietary restrictions. And so when we talk about what industry can do for us, what industry can do is work on the data interoperability standards of the systems that you're developing. Don't charge us for the proprietary data storage. Charge us for the value that you add to the data that we provide. And the final point that I would make, and as I get older, I always forget my final points. Um, <laughs> hold on. We'll see if I can recapture that, that train of thought is, oh, digital engineering, right? So we talk about model space systems engineering and the importance of digital engineering in helping reduce, I think, the time it takes to develop things, the cost of um, deploying it or developing it and deploying it. We need standards there as well. I need industry to tell me what's the best way to do model space systems engineering from the data interoperability. I don't want to have to say the DOD standard is X, Y, and Z. 
I don't have to do it for telephones. Why am I having to do it for these other very critical capabilities that we need industry standards for? So I do think that there's some level of self-organization that industry can help us with. Help us figure out what's the best approach because we cannot afford to make bad decisions up front because somebody had a really good salesperson. Sorry. Good. Sir, if I could take this time now to plug as a service component under Indo-PACOM and as a service provider to the joint staff from DOD, we'd like to introduce an, an option and possible thought to how we could you know, further enhance our ICAM strategy and, and take a look at you know, uh, the opportunities for a mission partner profile, right? Take, using our, uh, creating identities and, and attributes based off of existing information exchange agreement that's already been pre-approved, right? And then automating that process by onboarding and creating user groups for those types of attributes and, 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 uh, and identities and allowing us to pass traffic that way, right? It doesn't have to always be in a SecRel environment or in any type of classified format. Some of, if it's pre-approved, it's already an agreed, agreed upon information exchange that this should happen with that partner force, what we're missing is that <coughs> platform to do it in, right? So I, I would add, I would ask, I guess this is a, a request, if we are gonna put, push forward with an Indo-PACOM ICOM strategy that we, we look at that. The concern here is that it's easy to do it with Five Eyes partners and Avcans because it's already prescribed on how you're supposed to do that, hence the MPE environment out here in the Indo-Pacific. The concern for us are those that don't have, the have-nots, right? The ones that we're working with that, that uses Gmail and Facebook as, their, as their, their mission command tools of choice, right? How do we get them on board to a common platform where we can't push information to them in real time that's relevant to the previous question to what they need? So I would ask if, if we could look at that option as we pursue an ICAM strategy in the Pacific. Very good, next question. Thank you. Uh, technology progresses rapidly, particularly in the C5ISR space. Could the panel share some thoughts on how best to enable tech to be implemented in a timely fashion? Yeah, yeah, I can start off with that. I, I think a lot of the things that we are looking at to, to provide those uh, enablers is, one, we're not trying to solve world hunger right off the bat. It, these can be small, quick wins for us that, that rapidly improves the, the warfighter's capability to do things. Uh, just even small programs that gives you automation and populating a data link or you know any of those types of things. And so I think when we look at just the, the comprehensiveness of C5ISR. We, we think we've got to build that network, that system, cradle the grave and have it perfect right off the bat. Like we want an iterative process where we take small wins and just rapidly develop them. And so uh, I would say what's winning for us is getting those small victories and so we can quickly incorporate them and then build off of that. Uh, that's really what we're looking for and to provide that innovation. Uh, and so e even though you may look at it and go like, this is a really small program, it, it may be a force multiplier for us that we can incorporate in. And I guess I, I would go back to some of my opening comments. So how, how we could best, along with that, that's a great answer. I, I would say how we could be rapid once we get through the process is come to the table with a con op, come to the table with a diagram, an OV1 or some kind of tech diagram. So we, we could, you know, I guess I could, especially if it's something that's joint, so we could bring it across the services to see where it does fit. Come to the table with a training plan of how we're gonna rapidly integrate the, the, the users or the managers of, of the technology. Uh, and then in your, in your con op, have it be relevant to the, to the tactical problems that are being solved. So it, you know, I, I, that's, that's part of that, the, the acquisition strategy of, of how a, how a program manager would field a system that we short circuit a lot of times if we're, if we're just um, trying to inject technology in an already technologically crowded space. Any, any other ads? I'm, I'm gonna, so I, I, we've learned our lesson uh, from this, but I will tell you, timely is, 
is measured in uh, effectiveness as well. So I think right. just, just to your comment about we can throw technology at a problem, but if we don't integrate it into our process, our, our scheme of operations and train our, you know what I mean, uh, uh, cyber operators how to use it, it it's, doesn't matter how timely it is, it's not gonna work, it's not gonna be effective. Great comment, so next question. Which service or services have achieved most notable successes in their individual C2 contribution to JAD C2? <laughs> when do you think a solution will be realized and what will it take in your opinion to achieve it? So here's an interesting point, right? When we talk about JAD C2 and we talk about ABMS project overmatch and project convergence, people think automatically that those initiatives are working on the same thing. Remember what I said about JADC2 being a very broad, scoped effort. How we're going to improve the speed of command and control. And so each one of these has achieved their own specific objectives as outlined by their service chiefs and they're working together in a way that I don't think services have ever worked together before. Project convergence gives the services an opportunity to come together and demonstrate, experiment, show how these capabilities are working. Project overmatch, communications as a service, figuring out how we use our existing systems to pass data over paths that weren't supposed to be used previously, right? and ABMS, figuring out where the choke points are in our battle management processes. These are very different things, but they all comprise important parts of JADC2. And so I will not compare one with the other. I have no favorite child. Um, I do think that solutions are being realized today. I think we're being very careful in what we promote and what we conceal in order to keep our adversary off, you know, off balance. We can't be fully transparent in an open environment because it gives the adversary an advantage and they will leverage it. And we don't have that corollary advantage with them. They're, they're fairly good at protecting, you know, what they're doing. So I would say, again, and I'm not an optimist. If, if anybody knows me, I'm very much a, I don't want to say glass half full kind of person, but I take a very realistic perspective on things. And I'm generally not someone that's going to blow sunshine at you. But I will tell you that the services are working together, they are aligned, and they're making progress. And that's all we can ask of them today until we and DOD provide them very specific priorities. In the absence of those priorities, they've begun moving out because we cannot afford to wait. Indo-PACOM cannot afford to wait. Thank you for not, not uh, your true, true joint uh, uh, sailor there, because uh, you could have taken that opportunity in a different direction. But uh, we'll, we'll, let's keep our competition on the football field and our cooperation on the battlefield. So thank you, Susan. Appreciate that. Thank you. Next question. Are there war fighting con concepts that aren't working in the Indo-Pacific or that need to be improved for fighting in the near peer environment? Um, I, I wouldn't say we're identifying things that aren't working. There's just things that um, have a high workload in, in front of it. And, and again, like we talked about, it, it is a challenging environment that we're asking to, to put together these, these capabilities. Uh, when you look at it, we, we've been running a marathon for the past 22 years, and now we're asking the joint force to go out and bench press 315 pounds, which probably isn't Ron, you know, hard for Ronnie, but for the rest of us is <laughs> like a, quite a challenge. Um, <laughs> And that's, and that's really what I would say is the, is the crux of the issue. Like, we don't have the luxury of time. We don't have the luxury of, of distance. We're fighting that. Uh, and we're in a, a highly contested environment. And so what we are really trying to iterate on is making sure there's resiliency and redundancy. If I can't do it, somebody else picks up the tasking. 
Uh, that information is getting communicated uh, across the force. Uh, it's done in a fashion that's accurate, uh, it's timely, and it allows you to deliver those effects in, in, in rapid fashion. And that, and that is not an easy challenge uh, to overcome. And so I would say for the initiatives that we have for the Joint Fires Network and for the, for the joint warfighting concepts that are out there, they're really based along those things, but it's how quickly can we continue to make progress on those so that way we can get the information and get it in the right cockpit, the right shooter, the, the right maritime platform uh, to deliver the effects that are out there. And, and, and to be able to do that in a secure fashion uh, across not only the joint force but the coalition force um, it, it is a challenge. And that's why I said right now we're not trying to solve word hunger, we just got to make prog progress. That is really what the name of the game is. We got to keep the ball moving. Uh, and that's really the initiative that, that we're trying to run with and, and trying to make sure the team gets. Can't say any better than that. <laughs> yeah. All right, next question. Thank you, sir. In several sessions, we've heard about breaking down barriers to data and improving data analytics as a means of improving visibility and making better decisions. Where are you seeing the majority of data silos today, and where are the visibility issues the greatest? That's a complicated question. That's a great question, but we could probably do a we could probably do a whole. AFSIA conference just on that question. The, uh, there's silos everywhere. We've built silos. I mean, due to how we, how we fund services and fund IT for the last couple decades. I mean, Goldwater Nichols is a, almost, I'm not going to say encourages silos, but that's just how, net, and that's how our networks were built and developed uh, across DOD. So we, because of that, we, we have a lot of silos, uh, and there's a lot of effort going into as we transition to, and we need to, and we've, okay, you've heard zero trust, you've heard data-centric security a few times on this panel, probably dozens of times over the last few days. Um, I, in, probably not a surprise to anybody when you hear it, uh, due to not only where DOD's going, but just industry-wide in general, as we, as, you do net, as we do network security and cybersecurity. Um, so as we do that transition, I, 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 I I don't know that I can answer the second half of it, maybe somebody else in the panel can, about majority of where the silos today are, but it is just, a, it's an environment that is full of silos. Um, uh, so, the, the, you know, some of the, the same answers and concepts to try and, uh, uh, to, to get an enterprise ICAM solution, you know, it's even more complicated when you, when you come to uh, the, the data side. Uh, but that's part of JADC2. That's part of the Chief Data Officer and Integrations Office in the in the Pentagon's look. That's why they're involved in JADC2 uh, to look at the data layer of that uh, of the of the implementation. Um, and it is not an easy solution, uh, but it's it's an exciting area to work in because there's a lot of innovation required there. So I'd offer an analogy, right? When we were growing up, the refrigerator did not need to talk to your phone, yeah. right? The dryer didn't need to talk to your phone. And so the systems were built to do the functions that we believed they needed to do. Many of the systems that we built didn't need to talk to anybody else before. And so in addition to the Goldwater Nichols and, and the services, right? As we built these systems, we designed them to do specific functions and they do them very well. The world has changed. We need to share data. Technology has now allowed us to really, at scale and speed, take the reams of data that are out there, you know, and do something with them. Before cloud, we really didn't have that. So we're talking about how do we take old systems, even the F-35's an old system, and how do we make them work in a modern world where we have the power of big data coming to fruition for DOD? And so the value of what CDAO is doing is saying, I'm not trying to change the system. How do I get the data into an area where now I have applications on top that can leverage it? 
So we're taking a different approach to how we're treating our systems and how we're treating our data. But that's just the bridging solution. That's good enough for now. We need industry's help in figuring out how we leapfrog into the future. And it means, I believe, that many of our legacy systems that are very hardware-centric need to figure out how to break that down and how to make the functions to a certain degree hardware agnostic and software defined. That's the challenge that we have in front of us. And I think it's going to take all of us, including our partners, to break those barriers down. Sir, if I could add to that, if I could piggyback off of that one. I think um, the current level of where we're at with governance and data governance and, and structure is causing some of those data silos at the service components and subordinate commands. And I'll give you an example. Right, between the J6, the J2, the J3, we're all users of data and other staff that's also involved, but primarily driving operations. We set, the, as a six, we set up the infrastructure and move that data across all paths in the different aisles. Right, the two does a lot, right? They make sense of that data to drive towards, they have selectors and analytical tools that drive towards a refinement of that data to support PIRs and operations. The three executes that that data once they absorb it. The, the issue, at least what we're seeing from our side, is the roles and responsibilities between who owns what and where isn't truly defined, refined in, in certain organizations where we pick it up, you take it there, and you move it out, right? So that comes into ownership of tools and analytics, that comes into the convergence of tools and analytics, you know, between foreign, between unclassified and classified um, uh, data sources, right? And in certain cases, with the IC community, they, they, they leverage a lot of inter, um, interagency tools, right, to do a lot of that. We, as a six community, when we refine that data and take it from lakes and buckets and things like that, we have to know that we have to categorize that data. We have to containerize it in, in, in a way that they can digest it much easier through the tools that they use. And from there, we're a better service provider, in, in a sense, where we give them something that's usable. And they don't have to do that themselves. So I think, you know, further down the road as we mature in, in data governance across the board, I think that's going to take place. It's going to happen because we're going to be forced to. Operations is going to drive us to work together. But, it, but right now, where I see the silos happening is just that, right? You know, the, the, level, the current level where we're at with data governance across uh, commands and, and the down even to our level, we're seeing a lot of different buckets and where data sits. Let's take one more question, and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll give the panel members a, a few minutes for closing comments. Yes, sir. The final question. Regarding PEMTECH, what are the primary mechanisms you'll use to convey priority capability needs and then identify, assess, and bring on capabilities into the exercise, experimentation, iterations you've described? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say from a broad-based standpoint, uh, there's a few different concepts that we're prioritizing right now. Uh, one is the realism or as realistic as we can possibly get to, to mimic those adversary capabilities. Uh, one of the things that we despise when we put on these robust exercise programs is having to either white card, you know, like, hey, let's pretend, or this, the kids call it these days, LARPing. Uh, let's pretend like this cyber effect is now taking place. Uh, so as realistic as we can make those, so that way we get that high-end and quality training. Uh, the other thing is that we want them to be joint and cross-domain. So we need to be able to mimic cyber effects, cyber capabilities, space, land, sea, air. Uh, so that way, again, because we have joint fires networks and joint all the main command and control, we've got to be able to provide uh, that environment. Mobile is, is another aspect of it. So we need things that not only are fixed in place, but that we can move around to different areas and set up that training environment in those places uh, to achieve either some sort of integrated deterrence or to work with partners in, in a location that helps them out as well. Uh, and then finally, a command and control and assessments aspect of that. So how can we manage the training that's going on? How can we have good fidelity off of that? And now, how do we take those lessons learned, that data, and then incorporate it back into our plans, back into our operations, to continue to improve with our experimentation? 
Uh, so I would say broadly, that is really what we're communicating out. And then once uh, you know people get through the screener of the eight and we have our office call, those are the things that we're advocating as far as the next, what I would say, evolution is to our, to our Pentech program. Yeah, thanks. I, I just want to give a few minutes uh, to, to close, but I would ask, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about uh, uh, capabilities, about concepts, uh, about experimentation, about exercising. Uh, one of the things we, we did talk about was this sense of urgency. So as you're closing comments, any thoughts or ideas about how we can maybe accelerate um, and, and you know this iterative process or accelerate the the bringing in of new ideas or um, you know uh, pushing out you know new capabilities integrated with with uh, operations and workforce as, as you're closing I'd, I'd appreciate if you could kind of maybe touch on that a little bit so let's just I will go in order this time, so everybody knows when they're going to go. But so Mark, you, the, you drew the short straw, and you're going first. Oh, darn it! All right, all right. So I'll just close by saying that I look at we talk about sense of urgency. I, I think the th thing I think a lot about in, in support of U.S. Indo-Paycom and our boss is that if we if we did a fight tonight scenario, so if we had to execute a war plan against a, a peer adversary let's say in weeks, not months or years, there's two things I'm pretty confident in. One, we'd figure it out. We'd figure these challenges out. We've got, we've got some data points to go off of that. Afghan, you know, first iterations in Afghanistan and Iraq and in Bosnia, Herzegovina and heck in Russia, Ukraine and, and you know, technologies at various levels of experimentation being rapidly employed and, and baked into what we do. We got some amazing non-commissioned officers and warrant officers and uh, both military civilian planners and partners in industry. So, you know, I mean, we're the United States of America, we would figure that out. But uh, two, it would be painful and expensive. So anything we can do, anything I can do and our, my staff can do and we can do as a headquarters to buy down some of that pain and frankly some of that expense ahead of time, we, we owe it. And, and, and that's where our partnerships are. So, it, you know, that, that's not a specific way or process we can accelerate, but that's the sense of urgency we have as a headquarters. And, and that's the, the sense of urgency we, we, we attack and approach each of the problems. So uh, I appreciate the partnership and uh, thanks for the, uh, being able to be on this panel today. And I look forward to spending time with a lot of folks both over the next few days and hopefully at the reception tonight. So. Uh, yeah, I think General Miles earlier made a great point of doing the upfront homework as a key to success uh, on coming up with that con up, trying to figure out ways that it can plug into existing structures uh, and really operate joint and with, with partners. Uh, having said that though, um, so I'm relatively new to Indopaycom, I've been here for a few months and I can tell you the sense of urgency is tangible, like it, you can feel it, it is the direction that we've gotten from our commander that we have to move fast. And so if we see capabilities that will help us move, I mean, we're going to rapidly pursue it and, and get it so, uh, and put it into our system so we can work it out and, and, and get it through the ringer and then continue to improve on it. Uh, and so I would say that communication back and forth, having some strategic operational and tactical empathy of some of the things that you've heard here today of how do we get that information out? How can we distribute it? How can it help? Uh, get to the targets and the objectives that we need to get to, um, all, all helps us out quite a bit. Uh, but when we, when we get ready to put this into place, I, I'll tell you that the PIMTECH team is moving fast and these are very tangible programs that we have that are going out and executing. Uh, and so we want to move fast and we're looking for partners that are gonna go fast with us. And so that's why I appreciate the opportunity today to, to brag on the team that's doing some great work and have the opportunity to share the information with you guys. All right, so what I would say is continue the dialogue, right? Each one of the combatant commanders are gonna have their own requirements. The services are going to have their own unique requirements. Stay closely connected. I think we have to do a better job in many ways of establishing industry days where we can have classified discussions to help people understand what we're actually trying to get after and that's been a pretty constant demand signal from the various conferences that I've attended as well as Project Convergence 22, right? So we have to figure out how we improve 
our ability to have that discussion, understanding that not every company has clearances. So that, that's also something that we need to, to work with. Um, I, I'm really heartened by the way countries and industries came together to support Ukraine. I think there's a lot that a lot of lessons learned that we can take from that partnership and the acceleration. And there are lessons learned on where we may have fallen short in getting uh, speed to delivery. So that constant learning, that constant engagement, being demanding uh, consumers of our, what do you, what do you industry need from us as we tell you industry what we need from you? It's a two-way dialogue. If we are not meeting the demand signal, you need to let us know where we're falling short. And I know some of it is with sharing the information of what we actually need to accelerate. But I really like what Mark said a little bit earlier about understanding how your capability fits into the concept of operations, understanding how the training is going to fit into the way we do business. I think it's important for us to meet halfway, and, and that's part of that meeting halfway. So I look forward to the continued dialogue, and I, it's an exciting time, and I think we're all feeling the sense of urgency and, um, and partnership. So thank you. Go ahead, Ronnie. Thanks, sir. I just want to close with um, just relaying that partnership is important out here. In order for us to do what we want to do out here in the Pacific, that's teamwork. It's going to require a team to do that. Uh, we really can't do this to do, do the things that we want without the industry partners that we have today. The, the research labs are supporting us on a day-to-day -day basis, and FFRDCs are out there volunteering and giving us information that we may not have. Um, I think that team, you know, is, is necessary for us to collaborate and, and uh, speed up emerging tech that, that's really sitting at the lower TRL levels that we need, you know, at the operational level. Um, but as, as we do that, though, I just want to ask the, the folks that are out here that we be operationally minded and focus on what's, how this affects the operator on the ground, the warfighter that's out there who's got to use this tech, right? I understand that we all have to make, you, you guys got to do what you have to do for the businesses that you're supporting, but think about the operator who has to actually use this technology and whether or not it's going to actually support what he's doing, give him what he needs, or if it's something that may not, he may not, he's just carrying dead weight. So just, uh, I ask that we focus on that because that's, that's truly what we're, while we're doing this, this job here today. He or she. Yes, ma'am. He or she. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, team. This was uh, great. I appreciate uh, all of your leadership from all of your respective areas. This is a challenging thing, but we are, uh, I would almost put it in, the, in, the, in a capabilities race, right? Uh, for, um, frankly, our, our way of life, right? And so um, this is important stuff. Uh, and we appreciate what each of you are doing. And we appreciate what you're doing in the audience. Uh, it was, uh, I think it was uh, Admiral Paparo that said that if you're within uh, earshot, you're part of the solution here because uh, it's not going to be the government, it's not going to be the military alone that's going to solve this problem. It's going to be uh, partnerships, as we talked about, but that partnership is going to be with industry and academia. And that's the way it's always been. This is not new. The only new thing, uh, I think, in, in, in modern times, and, and somebody said it earlier, is that uh, industry is driving innovation in this space uh, in, in today's world. Uh, and so uh, this is going to be a great partnership and team effort. But thank you all, and I'll turn it back over to the, to the moderator. Or the uh, MC, I mean, I am the moderator, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> all right, at this time, uh, may I ask uh, Mr. Jeff Bloom, past president and board of directors for FCA Hawaii, to come up to Aloha, and again, wanted to say mahalo to everybody today. We've heard a number of comments and themes that we've been reiterated over the last few days, the last few months, and probably the last two or three years. I'll give you a few of them that I picked up on.
First thing is we need to break down data barriers to deliver information at tactical speeds. Relationships matter. And it's not just relationships across U.S., but being interoperable with our mission partners and allies. Um, we need to look at industry standards because industry is going to help us leapfrog into the future. We also, from an AFCA Hawaii, AFCA international perspective, industry days are critical. We've heard that a number of times this week, and we've also taken that to provide more of that here. Not when I go back to D.C. to the chapters in um, those areas or some other chapters on the mainland that have industry days. We have not really done a good job, but we can see. I appreciate, Admiral, you coming out here, spending the time. You and I were together in Augusta a few months ago, so we've seen you in different places. I uh, hadn't seen that in a while, but again, we had COVID for the last two years, so for JADC2, a lot of it has been more in the virtual realm, but we really appreciate that because these discussions, even though this AOR is really critical, and we all see that in the what I call the second push to the Pacific, but I think this one is more real than the one we had a number of years ago, but it really is critical to have the discussions. Secondly, I also want to thank General Fredenberg because he and I in Augusta talked about FCA seems to be all about the J6 and comms and not having six, seven, and eight SOC pack other folks in this arena. We should have had probably J2 up here as well speaking because it is a team sport. We heard that today, right? Not just PIMTECH is a team sport or Zero Trust is a team sport. What we're trying to do in this AOR to again keep our adversaries at bay so we don't have a conflict is really a team sport and not just a U.S. team sport. And one of the things we talked about earlier again is what we call coalition interoperability and that ability to have that community of interest and the dialogue and we've got to do more of it. So from an FCA Hawaii with our FCA board and our president and our EVP, I'm now just being put out to pasture as the, you know, past president, chairman of the board, whatever, whatever, now, you know, whatever my roles are. But I think it's important and it's important to see it through. So I want to thank everybody here. And again, we've taken a heart, and again, it's late, but one last thing, we do have our Pauhana tonight at six o'clock out on the Great Lawn. It does require a ticket. If you don't have a ticket, I don't know if you can still buy a ticket. Somebody from FCA here, uh, I don't know, would tell us, but someone will tell you down there if you don't have a ticket. Most of you probably already do. But we'd love to see you there. Uh, again, thank you to uh, all of our uh, speakers and our moderator. And if I don't look at this, then I will forget to say it correctly, but FC International, FC Hawaii will be making a donation to the Friends of Windward Wounded Warriors. So again, on, your, on our behalf from FC and FC International, again, we will ha take the coveted FC TechNet Indo-Pacific 2022 coin and give that to all of our panelists and our moderators. So again, mahalo, have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.